Hello, everyone. I'm Yi Chun Zhang. Uh, I'm the creator of OpenSD, an open source web platform project based on Nginx and Logit. Um, I'm very happy to share how we troubleshoot and optimize Nginx, OpenSD, and their backends for ourselves or, and for our relatively big community. Um, I prepared a lot of slides today, so I have to be quick. Um, I literally prepared like several months for this talk, and there's a lot of stuff in it, so uh, please spare me. Okay, so let's begin with common questions. Um, it's very common for, for example, your NGX worker, some of your NGX workers are eating too much CPU. Um, but the traffic's not much. Uh, like in this top screen, you can see that the CPU is 100%. Um, and also, sometimes your NES workers may never max out any CPU cores, no matter how hard you push it. Uh, so it also happens, for example, it max out 70 uh, something percent for each NGX workers, that's also bad. Because in theory, the NGX workers should max out the CPU when you push it hard enough. Um, also, your NGX workers may be taking too much memory. Um, it's, it can also be the case for various different reasons. Uh, for example, in this example, it takes th more than three gigabytes of resident memory. So we, we are, we're usually interested in RES instead of the virtual memory size because virtual memory size can be fake, can be terabytes because you don't have to use it. Uh, the resident memory working set is more interesting. Um, so one small point is that shared memory sizes also count in the RES size. Um, your NES workers may keep eating memory. It may be taking a lot, mem a lot of memory right now, but it may be um, growing forever. For example, the RES size is uh, always counting. Sometimes it can be um, temporary uh, when it grows to a certain point of size. It can, be, it can stop and it may even reduce a bit, so it depends. On the actual cases, you have to make sure that it's growing forever. Um, or maybe sometimes you see your NGX workers crash. <laughs> uh, actually, that's not the worst thing. The worst thing is the NGX worker taking too much memory and make everything horribly, horribly slow. For example, in your NGX error lock file, you may see something like this, codumped. <laughs> Uh, very um, can be very common if you use some crappy third-party NGX modules or buggy third-party Lua modules in your NGX process space. Um, also, in your system's D message log, the operating system's log, you can see something like this, SecFort. Um, also, sometimes you can um, see some weird NGX upstream timeout errors, maybe just temporary um, like this, when reading a response from response header from upstream, but you got upstream timed out. And for such things, um, you usually don't get much information. You need um, more advanced tools to pinpoint the real cause of it. Sometimes it can be network issues. Sometimes it can be your NGX worker is horribly blocked by something. Uh, so it it's not responsive to the upstream responses. Um, and also sometimes it could be um, so, uh, disk, disk issues uh, blocking your NGX event loop. Uh, and occasionally you may, you, you may see some small percent of requests um, served within a ridic ridiculously long latency. Um, uh, for example, in this example, just a very, very small, let, maybe less than 1% of the total requests are taking longer than uh, one second. 
So some, um, for, for such things, you want, you want, you want to know why. Uh, what, what is holding it back? Uh, why is taking more than one second while the others 99, more than 99% don't? Uh, so first thing first, stop guessing. <laughs> Let's go tracing. Sorry for the grammar <laughs> mistake. Um, it, it needs a different kind of perspective, so uh, maybe it, it, it may sound weird. So every running process is literally a real-time database. <laughs> uh, the traditional wisdom is to uh, add metrics or logging or uh, other monitoring um, places into the target processes to collect data from the processes and then put that data into some uh, relational or time series databases. But that's actually a really waste of resources because the process itself is a database. And, and to be more general, every running system, the whole operating system, the whole system, including everything on the user, in the user space, uh, is also a database, <laughs> a real-time, ever-changing database with an awful lot of information, everything that you can even imagine. Uh, so the software, the running software itself is a database. And we, as a developer or, 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 ops or uh, developers or some other roles of users can query this special kind of database using some query, um, query language, not SQL, but, but something um, specific to uh, dynamic tracing or debugging or profiling. Uh, so like every relational or key value uh, database, such software databases or software universes um, need some kind of schema information like what kind of tables you have and what relationships between the, these relational uh, tables, but this is not a relational database. Uh, so such schema definition is in the debug symbols um, in your system for every software you install and you, you're running. So, uh, so I, 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 I drew a picture. So. The most, the most popular debug information format is DWARF, D-W-A-R-F, and it provides a map so that you can walk around in the binary world. So welcome to the binary world. And in different kind of distributions of Linux, you can use different um, commands to install debug symbol packages for your software like the kernel, like your NGX, like your OpenSD, or databases like MySQL, PostgreSQL, Redis, PHP, Python, Go, uh, uh, anything that you can imagine. So there are various different kind of challenges here. So many online problems are very hard to reproduce. <laughs> uh, and especially when you are working in a large-scale network environment uh, where you have hundreds, thousands of machines running at the same time in different kinds of different places in the world. And some machines may experience certain patterns of problems during just a certain um, period of the day <laughs> and also only sensitive to certain uh, incoming traffic characteristics. Right? And these problems are usually only reproducible online. And also, it's important to uh, introduce no disruptions for the currently running online services when debugging. Uh, so it's not acceptable, for example, to <laughs> temporarily add um, traffic uh, routing rules to uh, make certain nodes offline and then do something nasty, so that's not acceptable, for example. And it's not acceptable, for example, to reboot the machine or reload your NGX or restart your NGX or even patch your NGX. So that's, uh, that, that won't work in, in the real uh, large-scale setup. And the binaries are usually also heavily optimized by, uh, for example, C or Rust or other kind of language compilers. 
Um, so um, we have these requirements. It has to be non-invasive, which means that you, you don't have to patch your dear NX source tree just to get some metrics or just to get some debugging logs. So that's not acceptable. And it's not acceptable to load certain kind of um, add-ons or plugins or modules into the target process space, like your NX process space, because that can potentially compromise your services. And also, they can have unwarranted side effects like slowing things down or introducing bugs. <laughs> and also, as I said, no restart or reload um, are required for the target processes because even for NGX reload, it can be quite expensive because, of, because all the worker processes have to be sh shut down um, before the, um, the new worker process can serve any new requests. Uh, actually, these two phases can overlap, but still, all the old workers have to be shut down. And also, no need to recompile the target software, and it has to be low overhead. Ideally, less than 5%, even at the peak um, throughput, uh, and has to be post-mortem debugging. So when something bad happened, um, we do something, because uh, really bad things cannot be predicted. <laughs> the most weird things are always a surprise. Um, and ideally, we, we need zero collaborations from the target software. So the NX doesn't even need to know we're watching, watching inside its body, and watching at its guts, like taking an x-ray. <laughs> and while it's, li it's live and it's running, just like taking an x-ray um, exam, exam for a human body. Uh, okay, so there are many common debugging and tracing tools out there. Um, many of them are open source and free tools. Uh, the most popular tool is GDB, but I bet most of the developers just use 1% of the feature set of GDB because it's so powerful. Uh, it has got so many advanced features over the recent years, as we, we, sh we shall see later. And also, System Tab is from Red Hat and got developers from IBM or, and Intel and other companies. Um, yeah, it's reasonable that Red Hat need dynamic tracing to serve their customers <laughs> because they sell technical support. It's very natural. And also, Dtrace is actually the first um, dynamic tracing tool out there, uh, born from the Solaris operating system. Uh, and also BCC and eBPF um, is a tool chain based on LLVM. And also there's a new baby from Mozilla, the RR tool for recording and replaying process execution um, without introducing much overhead. It's actually an amazing tool. Uh, I'll revisit this tool later. And also, there's a less known framework. It's an awesome framework, actually, in VMware <laughs> tool chain. It's proprietary, but uh, it also got the best things from Dtrace. Um, it's called vProbes. It can probe the whole virtualization software stack, including VMware's own um, virtualization kernel, uh, EX, e e e ESXi. <laughs> Kernel. And also, there's a uh, Linux perp tool, very lightweight command line tool set for many things, something non trivial. And uh, okay, for common solutions and courses, we, we, let's see what, what kind of tools we can apply to address the prob common problems we saw earlier. Uh, so let's see the pattern. So most of the tools can be attached to the target process or the target system um, via a single command like dash p. You can specify a process ID so that you can just uh, probe on to the target process. Or you can probe to all uh, multiple processes, like all the worker processes of NGX, of NGX server. Um, or you can omit the dash p option altogether or dash x option in the case of system tab. Um, to probe the whole system. So CPU is too high. It's actually a very easy 
problem to solve if we have the right tool. Actually, we do. It's the CPU flame graphs. So flame graphs, I think, uh, were invented by Brandon Gregg, uh, a former Solaris uh, performance engineer, systems engineer, uh, who invented this um, visualization method. Um, so oh, the, I also drew this graph. Uh, so basically, uh, the process is like a uh, Martian can climb, can climb up the CPU, and when, when it's running on the CPU, we, um, we do some profiling and sampling. And when it's not running on any CPU cores, we call it off CPU time. Uh, consider this very simplistic uh, NGX configuration. So we have a simple proxy configured uh, pointing to a local um, uh, server, and we have the gzip configured. Uh, note that we use the compression level of nine, okay? So we will see how much impact it will have on the, this server. Uh, okay. Okay, so the frame graph grows from the bottom to the top. It's, uh, it's like a backtrace aggregated together so we can see the context uh, of all the hotspots. So basically, we can see that most of the time, 94.35% of the CPU time is spent on the deflate function in ZLIP. It's for the um, GZIP compression. So that, that's huge, right? Um, so when we change it back to level one, it's much better. So it's, it's narrow, right? Now it's, we can see that it's less than 70% for the deflate function frame. And we can see all the way down to the main function, which is the entry point of every CPU ramp, right? And also the bottom is the, all the NGX output filter, out, output filters, right? Okay, so ideally we should avoid doing GZIP compression on the gateway, NGX gateway um, layer. Uh, it's better to be performed on the origin site so that it can also be cached if, if caching is allowed. Uh, but sometimes we need to change the response body data on the fly on the gateway uh, side. So in that case, we, we still have to do on the fly to the decompression and the compression. Okay, uh, and also um, it's important to configure the proxy uh, connection pools when the connections go to the backend, the upstream servers. So for example, in this frame graph, we can see that the connect, the connect tower is taking how much time? It's more than 30%, right? See the tooltip? The connect system core and the socket it, system core, um, library core is also taking uh, 8%. So that's a lot for the whole CPU consumption. Uh, the fix is to enable the connection pools for, to the upstream. For example, here we configure uh, keep live um, configuration directive in the upstream block uh, so that we can have 10 connections um, to the upstream for every uh, NGX worker process. Um, and also it's important to use HTTP 1.1 when going back to the upstream. And now in the new CPU flame graph, we can no longer see connect. No connect and no socket are visible. <laughs> so that's big improvement. We can only see the right V. Okay, so I, I need to say a little bit about the right V. So right V is now the bottleneck. Can we optimize it out? Uh, not really. So uh, it's, it's actually um, demonstrating the overhead of the Linux kernel's TCP IP stack. Um, so to optimize this away, people usually use some kind of user, uh, user land TCP IP stack implementation to bypass the kernel so that they can do really fast without going through, for example, the right V system call. Uh, but it, it, the, the, the kernel bypassing technique also has its own limitations. I, I won't uh, explain that uh, here because it's beyond this um, talk, just to mention it. Uh, so it's normal to see right V, okay? Right V being the bottleneck. 
And also, there's one way to reduce the write v system call overhead by um, buffering the data uh, more <laughs> to reduce the number of write v system calls. But it also has a catch. Before, because if you buffer more, you, uh, all, you, you, pr you, you have to uh, consume more memory footprint, right? And also, your client may see the data later rather than sooner because it's against the streaming processing principle. So it's, it's two sides of, uh, of, of a coin. So just to be aware, so you, you have to, for the most optimal system, you have to t uh, take balance among all the um, different, kind of con different kinds of considerations. Okay, so there's also a less known feature in NX called open file cache. You can actually cache the open file handles, the, the descriptors, um, when, for example, serving cached responses. Uh, so, for, for example, if we don't have the open file cache configured, we can see that this open uh, system call taking like 15%, more than 15%. And there's also a period. Period is, it cannot, cannot be uh, removed because you have to read the that that's cached data on the disk, right? And also there's a closed system core there. And we can add a simple directive to reduce that overhead by configuring this, this standard directive. Uh, you can specify a size. So be careful about the size <laughs> because this, this also can be uh, pointless. Because when I uh, worked for a CDM vendor in the past, we configured this size to a too large number, <laughs> and it actually introduced new overhead while traversing the red black tree, uh, introducing new, for example, spin lock uh, overhead and a semaphore overhead. So be careful about these numbers; they do make an impact. Okay, so after configuring the open file uh, cache, the new frame graph looks much better. Uh, the open system core is replaced by a new one. <laughs> Unfortunately, but the new one is, is taking less time than open. So it's the stat, the stat, the stat system core. Because even, even though you can cache and reuse the file descriptor, you still have to uh, get information about the file descriptor before you can actually use it. So uh, not a big improvement, but something. Uh, and we can, in OpenSD, we can use Lua, the Lua language to um, write very complicated application level logic. And it's important to get CPU flame graphs not only on the C level, but also on the Lua level. Uh, so we, we wrote a, actually several tools so that we can get the Lua land flame graphs and all the frames are Lua function core frames. Uh, and the top frames are actually C frames, so we can see C and Lua in the same graph, which is pretty cool uh, and can be very useful. And also, we can have ProLand CPU flame graphs if you use the Pro module in NX or running Pro applications behind NX. Okay, so this is a huge Pro application we wrote um, in, in the last year. So basically, it's uh, compiler that compiles the Pro6 language. I'm not sure how, how many of you um, heard of Pro6. <laughs> so it compiles a Pro6 language into Lua code so that we can use Pro6 to write OpenSD applications uh, instead of using Lua because Lua is not so uh, expressive as Pro6. Pro6 is so nice. I really love it. Uh, so uh, this frame graph, but, but the but the uh, Pro 6 compiler we developed uh, was written in Pro 5. So this frame graph shows a Pro 5 level CPU frame graph. We can see most of time is spent on the Pro 5 uh, parsing, recursive descent pars parsing uh, module called PEGX. Okay. Um, and also we have Python land CPU frame graphs very easily. So this, so the Pro land frame graph only took me like, um, less than 600 lines of code, and the Python takes um, like 500 lines of code, so it's very simple. And we can get um, the Python 
level frame graphs, for example, in this sim simplest Python HTTP server, we can see the dedent, the dedent um, method of text wrap module taking a lot of CPU time, which is a surprise, actually. And also the date formatting is taking a lot of time. Obviously, it's not optimized. So this service is way slower than NGX, uh, like, like more than 10 or 20 times slower. Oh, I have to be quick. Sorry. And we can also, we can also have PHP, Ruby, along Node.js, CPU, Flamegrass in the same way. And, and also for the Redis server, CPU, Flamegrass, we can see that get time of day, this system core is taking a lot of time. Uh, this is also a surprise. So we can make a Redis server faster um, by uh, caching the time, maybe, like NX. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so using flame graphs, you can always find, you know, almost always find the surprises. <laughs> uh, I remember that one time I find that a former colleagues left a patch for debugging in the production server software tree, <laughs> which, is, which is a surprise. And he left the job, but the code stuck there forever. And until one day, I sampled a CPU flame graph and found it out and quickly re remove it. And our online system became much faster. Uh, so for CPU flame graphs, we can find spin locks, which takes a lot of CPU time, or crazily backtracking regular expressions if you are using a backtracking regular expression engine like PCRE. Uh, or recompiling reg regular expressions when, when you should cache the compiled results in the first place. And also there are heavy computations like image processing or data compression or decryption, encryption, or dynamic allocations and garbage collection. Uh, this, this applies to uh, C and Lua and other languages, VMs. And also, or excessive system cores like connect, get time of day, or your Lua code is interpreted instead of JIT compiled can also be lead to slow performance. So CPU is too low. We can use off CPU flame graph. So uh, there, there's the other off, the opposite side of the world uh, when the process is actually sleeping, not doing anything, like, like waiting for a lock or waiting for some I/O event. Uh, Ideally, in a perfectly performed NGX worker process, we should see something like this. Uh, this kind of off CPU flame graph. So just the EPO weight or EPO uh, P weight taking most of the off CPU time. This is important because uh, when your NGX server is not serving uh, any requests or not doing anything, it, it's not supposed to eat up all your CPU, right? So it has to be wait, waiting. And the, uh, the the expected way to, to wait for more requests is to blocking on P weight. So that's a good kind of blocking. Uh, and in, for example, in this configuration, we have a Lua program using io.poben to open a pipe um, to run a who am I shell command. But it, it's a blocking operation, as we can see from this off CPU frame graph for this example. So almost all of the view time is no longer in EPO weight, but in the, uh, the Lua's uh, F read, the pipe reading operation. Okay, and the fix is to use our upcoming uh, non-blocking NGX pipe API to do the non-blocking shell so that the EPO can uh, handle the events for us. And we can rewrite the example here. So this feature is is going to be open sourced soon. And, and now it's back to the perfect off CPU flame graph. Only EPO P weight is present. Okay, so for off CPU flame graph, we have blocking, blocking IO operations like disk IO, or like blocking network IO, which should never uh, be present in, in the NX context, or locks and semaphores or overloaded systems with heavy process preemptions because the kernel scheduler can also preempt your NGX processes with force. Um, so when your off CPU flame graph look like uh, on CPU flame graph, then it means that your system is overly overloaded. <laughs> so that's a special case, right? Because your um, process can be preempted um, at any time in its execution. Um, 
So this guy is going crazy. You can also get the virtual file system latency or data volume flame graphs. So flame graphs can be applied to other system metrics. Uh, memory footprint is too big. We can do memory usage analysis in the process space. For example, in this example, we, we, we get all the statistics about um, all the lure garbage collectible objects in a running process, like strings, like functions, user data, whatever. You can find the largest ob GC object out there in a running process uh, very easily, and also uh, GC stat and GDB. In GDB, you can do that too. Um, oh, I'm running, running out of time, sorry. I have to be quick. So the allocators can have some pitfalls and memory usage is growing forever. Uh, we, we need a memory leak flame graph. You say actually found a real leak in the NGX core. <laughs> so that, that was the first successful um, usage, use case for the flame, leak flame graph. Uh, so we need to filter out noises and some requests taking too long to respond. We can do latency um, decomposition analysis and we can also check the TCP uh, state for a user land socket file descriptor very easily because you, for the first time you can trace the kernel and your user land processes at the same time, which is incredible because <laughs> uh, you can have the full access to the TCP uh, state, like whether it uh, uh, it's, has received any data. Um, for code dumps, we have to use GDB tools like uh, LVM stat, um, okay, let's be quick. And then Mozilla R can be used to record non-determinism. And, and actually, we, we ran into an Intel, Intel CPU bug in, in one of the codons, so it's, it happens. And behavioral bugs like function core tracing, we can trace, for example, the Lua function core entry and the access with all the actual arguments and return values printed out so that we can know what, what is stirring under the hood without adding any print statements to the target program, right? And also this is for a per, per, per program, per process. You can have the per uh, core events recorded very easily in a Python core events and even with backtraces, the Python backtraces without calling Python. Um, so for a relational database, we can have the uh, query plan level latency flame graphs. This is something we invented. Uh, we, we've never seen such things before <laughs> other way, uh, elsewhere. So basically, you can look inside the query plan um, operations, how much time is taken and what kind of relations tables or indexes is accessing so that you can d uh, do such profiling um, under the level of single query, right? And on a real um, online PG um, service, so using the real traffic. <laughs> and also there's a virtual file system latency flame graph for PostgreSQL we wrote very quickly. And you can also see the, the, the latency distribution inside a single SQL query. And it doesn't have, okay, I don't have the time. Um, so Syntab is works like this. It has this. Um, so Dtrace uh, is, works like this. It has the in kernel VM, and and Syntab compiles the program to kernel module and uses the kernel facility U probes to probe the target process. Um, and BCC PPF uh, also has a similar in kernel virtual machine like Dtrace in the Linux kernel, but it's much more limited. Uh, it also uses U probes to probe the target process. It's much safer. Um, and GDB, you use Ptrace. GDB uses Ptrace to probe the target process. And it can also be used to probe the codons. Uh, perv is lightweight. Uh, okay, so the real, real thing I really want to talk about today is actually this, the Y language. So we can see that we have so many you know, different tools and they each have um, the good and bad, but how about combining all of them to enjoy all their advantages and avoid all, all their disadvantages? Uh, the, the way is to uh, introduce a high-level abstraction called the Y language so that we can compile a single form of tool into different kinds of um, things. For example, the full Y can be compiled to system tab scripts or GDB scripts, Python scripts at the same time. Um, 
and you can do C-level type checking using the dwarf information and strictly follow the GCC, the C compiler behaviors, standard or non-standard, and you can miss code for different tracing tool chains like GDB, like LLDB, like DTrace and everything. So right now, uh, GDB Python and System Tab are supported, but more are coming. Uh, so this is a simple Y program, and it can be compiled to, um, diff and it also can have warnings like GCC. <laughs> uh, so we, we're doing a lot of things here. So for this single line of code, you can generate uh, the macros from the dwarf debug information automatically. So this is from Lugit. And you can generate this uh, GDB Python crap. So <laughs> it's very horrible to write GDB Python by hand. It's crazy. So it should be generated by machines in the first place. And also, system tab is much better, but still crazy. So this is a generated system tab uh, code. And we used to, to write such craps ourselves for years. <laughs> and it was, really, it was really driving us nuts. Uh, uh, so YLAN is, has been planned for several, several years. Uh, we finally got it implemented. And virtualization, we don't have the time, the Docker, the QEMU, KVM. So all of the um, virtualization stacks can be um, probed uh, by the tools with some changes. I don't have the time to go into details, but it's, work, it's workable. You can probe a guest virtual machines from, the, from within the host, host systems uh, without um, breaking anything. Uh, so OpenSD Trace is an automated platform to aut automate all the bloody details. And we can also do distributed tracing across a large cloud environment. Uh, we can also have a dedicated build machine to um, build the tools and deploy them to all the target machines uh, very quickly and very safely because there are so many details that, that could go south. Uh, okay, so finally, we can, we can do that. We can do automatic pattern matching against flame graphs so that machines can even interpret the flame graphs instead of humans, right? So even for dumb um, beginners who can also make use of these tools without you know, much knowledge about the internals, uh, system internals. And also we can do machine reasoning using uh, the, the, the expert system tech technology or even new neural networks um, algorithms. And uh, we can also establish a knowledge base for all the open source software, different kinds of software and all their versions. And also it can even di discover new facts and new rules as, as the system goes. Okay, so we have these open source tools there, and the YLAN is still an in-house uh, platform. Uh, we, we, we used to serve our own customers. Um, so yeah, we, we, we're gonna open the trace platform to a uh, wider audience uh, in the near future. Okay, thank you. We don't have the time for Q&A, but you can always reach me at etrun at <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.